Okay, we're really honored to have Arun Gandhi here. He has never been in this part of Arkansas before. <laughs> he said he was only in Arkansas one time when it was in Little Rock. So this is a rare occasion to have him up in our part of the world. I met Arun, it's been several years ago now. We were both speaking at the Virginia Beach at the ARE, and he was the keynote speaker there. And that's when I first met him. And I remember you coming up to me, and you were talking about I was a publisher, and you said, would you please look at my book? And he had written the book about his grandmother. And he said, everywhere he took it, how long was it you were trying to get it published? 12, 13 years. Everyone he talked to them about it, they said, nobody cares about her, write about your grandfather. But he, I said, well, send me the book and we'll look at it. And it was so beautiful because it's an unknown story of the grandmother and also the grandfather because there's a lot, you know, there's always a woman behind the man. <laughs> and there was a lot that was never included in the other biographies. A lot of the family secrets, I guess you would say. <laughs> but Arun found a box he said he was interviewing, I'm not going to take away from your talk, but he said he was interviewing everyone he could find that was still alive who knew his grandparents to get information about the grandmother. But as soon as he'd start talking about, about Gandhi, they would switch over to the grandfather. So it took a long time to get the information and all the little ins and outs. And when he was at the ashram in South Africa, you found this box of letters that nobody knew about. So he had a lot of information there that he put into the book. So we printed that, and that's how we gained our association together. <laughs> and he has had some other books out here that your association has printed. So I guess we've been friends ever since. And this is why the first time that I've ever asked him to come, and he, he said immediately he would. And I said, the only thing I'm apologizing is that this room is a packed full of people because I think they're missing a rare opportunity. So let's, let, let's welcome Arun Gandhi. Okay. Thank you very much, Dolores. It's a wonderful introduction. When Dolores called me to invite me to come to this conference, I couldn't say no to her. We have been such good friends that it's very difficult to say no to anything that Dolores asks for. And I also thought it was appropriate because this conference is centered around transformation, that uh, I come here and I speak about my grandparents because I think my grandfather really transformed himself completely. Uh, he is the modern example of how we can transform ourselves and become better human beings. He used everyday instances, you know, mundane uh, instances that occur in our lives all the time but we generally ignore them and, and let them pass by. But he took those instances and those episodes to change his life. And I want to share with you some of those episodes. There. When he was a little child, he says uh, the first influence was from his mother because she was a very spiritual person and in the Indian uh, sense a spiritual woman takes various kinds of vows all the time and uh, these vows usually mean that you have to give up something that you love the most and since we all love food the most it's connected with food and she would sometimes take the vow of not eating until she saw the sun. 
And normally one would say, well, what's so great about that? You see the sun every day, so you would eat every day. But she would take this vow during the monsoon season. And during the monsoon season, sometimes for days together, you don't see the sun because it's covered by the clouds. And so she wouldn't eat for all that time. And grandfather says, as a little boy, he was so disturbed by this that he would sometimes go and sit at the window and pray to God to part the clouds for a moment so that the sun can peep out and his mother could see the sun and eat. And sometimes it happened. And when that happened, he would scream and yell and tell his mother, come quickly to the window and see the sun. But by the time she left what she was doing and come to the window, the, the clouds would cover up the sun again. And she would just laugh and go back and say, well, God doesn't want me to eat, so that's fine, no problem with it. But she never pulled a face. She always smiled. Uh, she always did everything with a smile. She cooked food. She fed the children. She fed the adults. Uh, everybody, she did all her household chores. Um, and yet, sometimes for days together, she hadn't eaten anything. And grandfather always said that that devotion and dedication uh, was something unique and that really inspired him uh, tremendously. The uh, second woman to influence him in his childhood was his nanny. Now he was a very frisky little boy. He would um, walk away and, and run away somewhere, you know, uh, and get lost and a couple of times this happened and, and the parents were... Um, aghast, you know, he was just lost. And it turned out that he had, uh, a circus was going through town and, you know, when the circus comes to town, they they take a parade of the animals and everything through the town to inform the people that the circus has arrived. And one day there was this parade going by and he was about five years old then and he just walked behind them and disappeared. Yeah and ended up at the edge of the town and the family was looking for him everywhere and uh, finally they found him but that's when they realized that they needed to get a nanny to keep an eye on him all the time. But he was also a very fearful young person. He was afraid of snakes, he was afraid of darkness. He wouldn't sit in a room without lights, he couldn't sleep without lights, he had to have the lights on all the time because he imagined snakes everywhere and he imagined thieves uh, coming into the rooms and, and all kinds of weird things he thought about. And when this nanny realized how fearful he was, she taught him to chant the name of the Lord. And she said, the Lord is there always to protect you. And if you chant the name of the Lord, he will protect you and you don't be, have to be afraid of anything. And in the in Hindu sense, the Lord uh, is Lord Rama. And so he learned to chant the name of Lord Rama whenever he was disturbed or, uh, or afraid or anything. And that conquered his fear. He was able to overcome his fear and, and uh, um, have faith in, in the Lord, uh, Lord's protection. So that was the second influence in his life that kind of molded his life towards uh, more spiritual uh, pursuits. But the real transformation in his life came at the age of 13. Now, some of you may be aware that he was 13 years old when he was married. At that time, it was quite normal in India for young children to get married. In fact, 13 was considered to be very old. They ought to have been married much earlier than that. But they were both 13 years old when they were married. And 
grandfather says that at that time he didn't know what the relationship was and that who was going to um, set the rules and who was to obey them and enforce them and all that. And so he started going to the local library and reading books on the subject. And the books were obviously written by male chauvinists <laughs> because they all talked about how the husband should lay down the rules and enforce them strictly. And so after reading this book, he came home one evening and he told grandmother that you are not going to stir out of the house without my permission from today. I want no arguments about it. This is the rule, this is the law, and you're going to obey it strictly. And grandmother didn't say anything at all. She just quietly went to bed. Um, and got up the next day and she continued to do what she always did. She continued to go out and visit and never bothered to get his permission. And after a few days when grandfather realized that she wasn't obeying him, he confronted her again and says, how dare you disobey me? Haven't I told you that you shouldn't go out of the house without my permission? And that's when grandmother very quietly without losing her temper. She said, I was brought up to believe that we must always obey the elders in the house. And I believe the elders in this house are your parents. Now, if you're trying to tell me that I should not obey your mother, but obey you instead, let me know so that I can go and tell your mother I'm not going to obey you anymore. <laughs> And of course, grandfather couldn't tell her to do that, and so the whole matter was settled without anybody losing their temper. And it was much later when grandfather realized how important it was for people to understand what is anger and how to use this energy positively. This happened at the age of 23 when he went to South Africa as a young lawyer. He was desperate to set up a legal practice. He was sent to England to study law. The family had taken enormous loans for his education in England. And everybody was hoping that he would come back and set up a practice and earn money and be able to pay back the loans there. But when he came back, to India after studying law and tried to set up a practice there, he failed miserably. On a couple of occasions, he couldn't even get up in the court and, and uh, defend his clients because he, he was so tongue-tied. He was afraid to speak in, in the presence of people. He had to refund the fees of the client and walk out in disgrace. And it got to a point when he, d he realized that he may never be able to set up a legal practice. And he began to look for a job as a teacher. And of course, the British government who controlled education in India at that time refused to give him a job as a teacher because they didn't recognize his matriculation. They didn't care about the legal education that he got in England, but because they felt that he didn't pass the right uh, matriculation examination. They refused to give him a job as a teacher. And I think it was a fortuitous, fortuitous thing that they didn't give him a job as a teacher because I hate to think of what would happen to him and to all of us if he had ended up being a teacher in a high school. I think it was because he was forced to go to South Africa, forced in the sense that he got this opportunity and he was desperate and he grabbed the opportunity and went there. And uh, with, within a week of his arrival in that country, he became a victim of prejudices and he was beaten up by some white youths. And when the police came and arrested these uh, people who had uh, beaten him up, 
and invited grandfather to come to the police station and file charges against them so that they could take legal action and punish them. Grandfather was walking up to the police station when he thought about this whole incident and he was reminded of the way grandmother was able to use her anger positively instead of uh, abusively. And so by the time he reached the police station, he was convinced that punishing these people is not going to help them understand their mistakes. That the right thing to do would be to forgive them and let them walk out and let them learn a lesson that this kind of behavior is wrong. And so he got to the police station and he told the police that he is not filing charges against them. And then he turned to the, uh, the four uh, people and he told them, he said, I am forgiving you and I am allowing you to walk out of this police station uh, without any punishment. But I hope you will learn a lesson from this episode. And the lesson is that we all need to live in peace and harmony with each other. That hate and prejudice is not going to really help anybody at all. It only destroys us and destroys our soul. And these four walked out from there and three of them became his followers for life. One person who didn't become a follower uh, didn't quite understand the whole lesson, but he stopped being a racist person uh, and um, gave up that kind of uh, prejudices that he had. But this episode brought to grandfather not only the importance of understanding our anger and using it effectively, but the important role anger played in understanding the philosophy of nonviolence. And that's the point at which the birth of the philosophy took place. And he began to think about it and, and read about it and, and kind of practice it uh, at home. Uh, he simplified his life, he gave up all the uh, luxuries uh, and uh, simplified, uh, you know, a simple kind of living. He set up an ashram uh, which was outside uh, the city of Durban and uh, they lived in, uh, on the land. They consumed only what they could grow on the land and so, you know, that kind of a very simple lifestyle was adopted as part of the study of the philosophy of nonviolence. But the more he studied it, the more he realized that there is more to nonviolence than what meets the eye. You know, today when we speak about nonviolence, we think that because we don't go around beating up people, that we are nonviolent. Or, for instance, a lot of vegetarians think that because they are vegetarians, they are automatically nonviolent. Now that's not true. We commit violence in many different ways, in ways that sometimes we don't even understand and don't even recognize as being violent. And these were things that he began to understand and began to realize and began to practice that. And he launched his first public nonviolent campaign in South Africa on September 11th, 1906. And it's a very <clears throat> important date for us here in the United States because September 11th, we all know, was the day the terrorists atta attacked us. But it was on that day that he launched the philosophy of nonviolence and he launched a public campaign. And now, on this September 11th, 2006 will be the centenary year of that event and the Gandhi Institute has decided to observe this event meaningfully and so we, are, we have been given permission
to use the mall in Washington, D.C., uh, just across from the Lincoln Memorial, uh, f for an interfaith prayer service. And so on September 11th at noon, we're going to have an interfaith prayer service on the mall in Washington, D.C. to commemorate this event. But then the Georgetown University decided they wanted to join us and they wanted to uh, hold a conference. So on September 12th, we are going to have a whole day of conference to discuss the importance of nonviolence and it's going to be hosted by the Georgetown University. And then some of the organizations in Washington DC felt that they wanted to get involved in the process too. And so many of these organizations have come together and we are going to hold a march on September 10th from the, from the statue um, that is erected uh, on Massachusetts Avenue, Gandhi statue, from there to the Capitol. A peace march will be um, organized. So these are things that are taking place uh, to uh, to observe the centenary of, of Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. But what I want to share with you today is what I was able to learn from it, from my grandparents and especially my grandfather because my grandmother died rather early, 1944, when I was still a young boy, very young boy, and the last time I met grandmother I was just six years old. So I don't have very uh, str strong memories of that period. But I have more memories of the, p the period that I left, lived with my grandfather between the age of 12 and 14. And I learned some very important lessons from him during that period. And uh, those lessons really brought to me the philosophy of nonviolence. The first lesson I learned was about using that anger. I was a very angry young boy because I grew up in South Africa and I was subject to the same beatings that my grandfather suffered and uh, I was beaten up by white youths when I was 10 and then a few months later beaten up by some black youths. I was hated by the whites and hated by the blacks and it filled me with tremendous rage and I wanted eye for an eye justice. And it became such an obsession with me that I started doing exercises and pumping iron so that I could build muscles and deal with people uh, violently when they attacked me. And this, when my parents saw this uh, obsession in me, they decided it was time to go to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and hopefully learn something from him. And so we went and uh, I stayed with him for about 18 months. And the first lesson that grandfather taught me was how to use, how to recognize anger and how to use it effectively. He told me anger is like electricity. It's just as powerful and just as useful as electricity is, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electric energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. And he suggested that I should write an anger journal. He said, every time you feel angry about something, don't act on that anger, but write, put it all down in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem, and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important. There's a lot of people today tell me that they have been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them because every time they go back and read the journal, they are reminded of the incident and they just get angry all over again. 
So we don't want to be reminded of the incident, we want to be able to put it behind us. So it's important that we write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit ourselves to finding that solution. And I did this for many years. And I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to channel the energy of anger into positive action. But after learning this profound lesson from grandfather, I decided to test him and see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. And this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. He was not only concerned about the independence of India, he was also concerned about the emancipation of the Indian women, the uh, education of young children, the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people. All of these issues were uppermost in his mind. And he had programs going on in all these different fields. And of course at that time, because the British controlled all the funding and they were not willing to fund grandfather's uh, programs, he had to find the funds for himself through his own uh, means. And he decided the easiest way for him to raise the money that he wanted was by selling his autograph. And every morning and evening, when he had his interfaith prayer services, when hundreds of people would come to the prayers, all of them would come and seek his autograph. And while I was living with him, it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And one day I thought to myself, I said, if everybody could get his autograph, why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. And so I got myself a little autograph book and I thrust it in the, in the middle of the pile and hoped that he wouldn't notice the absence of money there. But when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. That if you want an autograph, you will not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. I said, you're my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. And he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. And from that day, every day when he was in high-level political discussions with Indian politicians or British politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest, and went on talking politics. <laughs> In fact, on many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell grandfather, why don't you give him the autograph and be done with it? He comes and disturbs our meetings every day. And grandfather would just laugh and say, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in this. The long and short of it is that he never did give me that autograph. <laughs> but I don't remember his ever getting angry and telling me to get out of the room and leave him alone, as we would do with our little children or siblings. If they came into the room when we are working on something important, we shoo them out, get out, can't you see I'm busy just now, and so on. He never ever did that to me. And that's when I realized that if he was able to control his anger to that extent, if we can attempt to achieve 50% of that, we would make a tremendous difference in the level of violence that we experience today. And we need to do that. And I'm one of those who has been uh, advocating the teaching of anger management to children right from the elementary school all the way up to the university. It should be a compulsory subject. Everybody should learn about how to deal with anger in a positive manner. Because experts today tell us that 87% of the 
or almost 80% of the violence that we see in the world today is generated by anger. People getting angry and they do things or say things that sometimes changes the course of their lives completely. Our prison systems are filled with young people who acted in a moment of madness. And now if you go and ask them, they all would want to go back to that moment and change it. But once you have done something, there's nothing you can do to take it back again. So it's very important that we learn how to deal with anger and channel that energy into positive action. It's not, you know, we, we think that anger is evil, that we don't want to speak about it, we are ashamed of it. It's not anger that is evil. It is the way we abuse it that is evil. Anger is a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a wonderful emotion. It g gives us the energy and the direction of doing something and changing, uh, you know, something that has gone bad again. It's, again, to use the uh, analogy of electricity, it's like the trip switch in the electric circuit that goes off when something goes wrong. Anger is telling us that something is wrong and we need to pay attention to that. So it's like that electrical trip switch there. So it's very important, I can't stress this enough, that we learn about what anger is and how do we deal with it. But we also need to learn about what did Gandhi mean by non-violence. And I learned about this one day through a little pencil. I was coming from school and I had this notebook and a pencil in my hand and I looked at the pencil, it was about three inches long and I decided that I deserve a better pencil, this is too small for me to use. And without a second thought I threw that pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I went and asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do. Here's a flashlight. Take this and go out and look for the pencil. And I went and I looked for the pencil and I must have spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do, all the things that we waste and throw away and, and overconsume because we have so much of it that we don't know what to do with it, that every time we indulge in any of those acts, we are indulging in violence, either against nature or against humanity. We are told today, statistically speaking, that to maintain the level of affluence that we are enjoying here in the United States today, we are consuming 45% of the world's resources. And we are only 4% of the world's population. So if 4% of the world's population require 45% of the world's resources to maintain this level of affluence, 
It means that only 10% of the world's population can aspire to live at this kind of level. What happens to the other 90% of the population? And if we don't do something about it and don't share it with, with the rest of the 90% of the population, we are creating a major conflict. They're going to get angry and they're going to want a piece of the pie and they're going to get it any way they can. And so crime increases and violence increases and goes on and terrorism and all kinds of things. And we see a con continuous escalation of violence in our societies. So we have to simplify our lives. We have to be willing to share with other people and, and create a better living standard for other people also, so that we can all live in peace and harmony together. This was something that didn't quite make sense to me at that age. But it began to make more sense to me when he made me draw a family tree of violence. He said, the only way you will understand how much violence we commit every day is by doing some introspection every day and putting it down on this tree. And the tree was a tree of violence based on the genealogical tree, family tree, with violence as the parent with two offsprings, physical and passive. Now physical violence is all the kinds of violence where we use physical force against one another. All the murders and wars and killings and beatings and rapes and all of these things that we do to one another where physical force is used is physical violence. But passive violence is something that we tend to ignore. Because it's the kind of violence where we don't use any physical force against people. Yet we are able to hurt people, directly or indirectly. It's all the discrimination, oppression, suppression, economic, political, social, cultural, religious. The thousands of little things that we do every day that causes somebody some hurt. And that person then resorts to violence there. So when he made me draw this tree and examine myself every day and examine my uh, experiences during the day and put them down on this tree, within a few months I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. And that's when I became aware of how much passive violence I was committing. And that's when grandfather explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, consciously and unconsciously. And that generates anger in the victim. And the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. Because our whole justice system is based on violence. We are constantly told that we have to make somebody pay for what has happened and until we make somebody pay for it, we cannot expect closure. And so justice has come to mean revenge. We are seeking revenge. We want to catch somebody and punish that person severely so that they don't commit this kind of crime again. And yet, when you look at the whole system, we haven't been able to curb criminal activity at all. For centuries, we have this justice system. And we, every year, we have to escalate the level of punishment and, and uh, so on. And yet, we haven't been able to get a hold of crime. Because punishment really doesn't put down crime. It doesn't help anybody. It only makes the criminal more determined to continue in that lifestyle. I've been doing a lot of work in the prisons and uh, prisoners have con continuously told me, says, why do you expect us to change? And what is it going to do for us? Because society doesn't, will never accept us again in, in any case. 
whether we change or not, they, they have condemned us. They are not going to take us back in their community. And so why do we change? And I have to keep telling them all the time that you have to change not for the society but for yourself. You have to bring about that change because you are a human being and you want to be a better human being and not because society expects you to be a better human being. I don't know how much of it really enters their minds and I'm just hoping that these seeds that I'm planting there will eventually germinate there. But this is unfortunately the, the kind of violence that we continue to practice all the time. It's become so much a part of us that we have created a whole culture of violence around us. And if we examine our lives, we will see how deeply involved we are in the whole process of violence. That every aspect of our lives is involved in violence. And it's only when we recognize that, that we will be able to change that and, and you know, create a, a, a culture of non-violence. Until we have that culture of violence, we cannot practice, you know, some experts today um, have written books on the subject and they say that violence is a strategy. We can use it when it is convenient or discard it when not. And I don't agree with this. I don't agree that non-violence is a strategy to be used when convenient. It's like, you know, if we see a house burning on fire, and if the fire department comes there with two tankers, one filled with water and another filled with gasoline, and if they alternately pump water and gasoline into the fire there, is that fire ever going to come be under control? It will never be under control. It will just go on raging off and on. It will come subside a little and then rage again and go on and on. And that's basically what's happening with us. Because we live in the culture of violence, we practice the culture of violence, and then when sometimes we want to use non-violence, we use it as a strategy and go back to our culture of violence. And that's why when we work for peace today and we wonder why are we not able to achieve peace in, in this world, it's because we have not really sincerely understood the philosophy and not implemented that in our, in our lives there. So it's important that we understand the nature of the philosophy and, and be able to practice it uh, properly in our lives. I was also, uh, as I said, you know, we practice violence uh, in, ma in many different ways. Um, I want to share with you how we perpetuate violence in our lives by the way we treat our children. We punish our children when they misbehave. And we tell them that if they don't change, if they don't behave themselves, they're going to be punished, they're going to be, um, their allowances will be cut or whatever the punishment we choose to meet out at the, at the time. But we punish them. So we are basically telling the children that when somebody does something wrong, that person needs to be punished. And that is the way we perpetuate um, violence from generation to generation. But in a culture of non-violence, it's not punishment that is meted out, but penance. And let me explain to you what this means. In our family, when we were growing up, we were never punished when we misbehaved. And believe me, we did misbehave when we were little children. But I don't remember ever being punished. Whenever we misbehaved, it was the parents who did penance for us. And I remember on several occasions when I did something wrong. It was my mother or my father or both of them 
uh, who, who would do penance in the form of not eating, fasting, skipping a meal if, the, if it was a minor infraction, or fasting for the whole day if it was a little more serious. But they would feed us. They would sit with us, they would talk to us, they would feed us, and they would say they are not eating because they were not, as parents, they were not able to teach us the right way. And therefore they have to take the responsibility of the uh, wrongs that we had committed. And we felt terrible about it. And we made, our, made up our minds uh, that we would never misbehave again if, if this is what's going to happen to our parents there. So they were able to, through their own penance, they were able to teach us the value of, uh, of relationship. Now that's another very important aspect of the philosophy of nonviolence, building relationships. Now if the relationship between the parents and the children are not based on respect and love, the children won't care at all if the parents did any penance. They will just shrug their shoulders and say, well, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it. But it's because the relationship between the parents and the children are based on love and respect that we felt hurt if our parents um, didn't eat that day. So res relationship is a very important aspect of the philosophy of nonviolence. Much of the violence today we experience is because of our bad relationships, because of the kind of lifestyle we have chosen, which is based on materialism and capitalism. It has made us selfish and self-centered. We measure everything with material yardstick. We measure success with material yardstick. A person is successful if he or she has a big bank, bank balance or if he, he or she has a fancy car or may, a, a lot of property. All material things add up to success. There. And so we are teaching people to be selfish and self-centered, to think about themselves, not about other people. Just become successful yourself. Often we tell this to our children that you have to be successful in life, you have to get to the top and get there by any means possible. Don't think about other people, but you get to the top there. When we have that kind of a relationship between people, it's going to lead to a lot of conflict. And that's why we are not able to maintain relationships today. And, and because we are not able to maintain relationships, uh, we have conflicts and violence. In a non-violent society, relationships would be built on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation. And it's only when we respect that, you know, and, that, and that's very important because a lot of people today, especially here in the United States, they tell me that they are independent individuals and they can do whatever they like and it's nobody's business. And that's wrong. We are not independent individuals and we can't do whatever we like. We are interconnected, interdependent and interrelated, not only as human beings but with all of creation. And we have to respect that fact. And it's only through the respecting that fact that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are here to fulfill a purpose. And we will understand that purpose only when we understand what our role in this creation is. And when we are able to understand that, then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not identify ourselves by the labels that we have put upon ourselves. Today we identify people by the labels. We have religious labels, economic labels, social labels, cultural labels, you name it and we have a label for it. And every time we put a label on a person, 
we are creating a conflict because we are building a wall between that person and ourselves. So we have to remove all those labels and begin to look at each other as human beings. And it's only when we are able to do that, that we will appreciate our own humanity. So these are the four positive principles on which relationships must be built in a non-violent society so that we can reduce the level of conflicts that exist today. Now, yesterday while we were having dinner when we came in here, we got into a discussion on this subject and uh, there was some <clears throat> friends who said that we cannot create a non-violent society, a totally non-violent society. And I agree with them. It's impossible to create a totally non-violent society because we commit and we have to commit some violence in, in very, various different ways. The very fact that we walk around from place to place, we are committing violence. We are crushing little life forms all the time. And so it would be impossible to create a totally non-violent society. But we can certainly reduce the level of violence that exists in our society today. And that has to come from our determination to reduce that violence to the bare minimum. If we are a civilized people, a civilized nation, then we ought to be able to control violence. But unfortunately, we find that the more civilized we become, the more violent we are. And that's something that's contrary. And we have to change that and, and really show that we are civilized in the true sense of the word there. So we, the attempt here is to reduce the level of violence to the bare minimum. Now, coming back to how we perpetuate violence, I want to share with you two stories of how this happens in parenting. In the first story, and this happened in 1940 when I was six years old, and uh, we were live, visiting grandfather in India again, and living in the community that he had started there. And in this community, there were about two, three hundred families that had come together where he had invited people to come and live a, a non-violent lifestyle. And in that community, there was another six-year-old boy. And we got on very well together. And this boy had a tremendous sweet tooth. I mean, he just could not resist sweets. He had to have sweets all the time, sugar, candies, or desserts, or chocolates, or something. And if he didn't get anything, he would just take spoons full of sugar and eat. And the result was that he started getting a rash all over his body. And his parents took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, you've got to stop giving him sweets until he's cured. And then you've got to monitor how much he eats. And so the parents came home and they used their parental authority to make the child give up sweets. They said, no more sweets for you. No arguments about it. The doctor has said no. And so you are not going to get anything. And yet they would have sweets on the table and everybody else would be partaking of it. And so the boy didn't obey the parents. And when nobody was looking, he would go and grab something and eat it. And he couldn't be cured. So after a few days of this um, hassle between the parents and the boy, the parents brought him to grandfather and pleaded with grandfather to speak to him and explain to him why he should not eat sweets. And grandfather said, you come back after 15 days and I'll speak to him. And the parents went away and they didn't know why they had to wait for 15 days. Why couldn't grandfather speak to him immediately? But they didn't d uh, discuss this with grandfather and they just... Uh, went back and came back after 15 days and grandfather took this boy aside and spoke to him for less than a minute and the boy went home and gave up sweets wouldn't touch sweets anymore 
And the parents were aghast and they said, what kind of a miracle did you perform? They came back to grandfather and asked him, what kind of a miracle did you perform? That we were trying to teach him the same thing and he wouldn't listen to us and yet you were able to speak to him for less than a minute and he instantly obeys you. And grandfather said, it wasn't a miracle. So the reason I asked you to come back after 15 days was I had to give up eating sweets before I could ask him to give up. And so all I've told him is that I have not eaten sweets for 15 days and I'm not going to eat until you are allowed to eat. So will you give it up? Now this simple thing we as parents don't do. We would rather use our parental authority and make our children do what they have to do, but we won't make the sacrifice along with them. And that's very important, that we have to show that kind of a relationship and love for our children, not only in, in the sense of uh, telling them how much we love them, but it has to be demonstrated in our relationship with them. And this was a second story that happened to me when I was 16 years old and we had come back from India and living with the grandfather, I'm, I'm sorry, living in the community that grandfather had started in South Africa, which as I said earlier, was uh, 18 miles outside the city of Durban in the midst of sugarcane plantations. And when my two sisters and I were growing up there, we didn't have anybody our age to relate to. So we would look forward to going into town and visiting friends and seeing a movie or something. And one Saturday I got that opportunity when my father had to go to town to attend a conference and he didn't feel like driving that day and so he asked me if I would drive him into town. And I jumped at the opportunity and said yes. And since I was going into town, my mother gave me a list of groceries that she needed. And on the way into town, my father reminded me of all the little chores that had been pending for a long time. And he said, since you have the whole day to yourself, will you please attend to these chores? Like getting the car serviced and oil changed and all that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I said, all right. And when I dropped him off at the conference venue, he said, at five o'clock in the evening, I will wait for you outside this auditorium. Come and pick me up and we'll go home together. And I said, okay. And I rushed off and I did all my chores and I bought all the groceries and did everything I was expected to do. And left the car in the garage with instructions to do whatever was necessary. And being a 16-year-old, I went straight to the nearest movie theater. And I got so engrossed in a John Wayne double feature that I didn't realize the passage of time. The movie ended at 5.30. And I ran out from there and I went to the garage and got the car and rushed to where my father was waiting for me. It was almost 6 when I reached there, one hour late. And he was naturally anxious and wondering what happened to me and he was pacing up and down. And so the first question he asked me is, why are you late? And instead of telling him the truth, I was so ashamed to tell him that I was sitting there watching a John Wayne double feature that I lied to him and I said the car wasn't ready, I had to wait for the car, not realizing that he had already called the garage and asked them. When he caught me in the lie, he said, there's something wrong in the way I brought you up that didn't give you the confidence to tell me the truth that you felt you had to lie to me. And I've got to find out where I went wrong with you. And in order to do that, he said, I'm going to walk home 18 miles. I'm not coming with you in the car. There was absolutely nothing I could do to make him change his mind. He just started walking. It was after six o'clock in the evening. Much of those 18 miles were through sugarcane plantations, dirt roads, late in the night no lights. I couldn't leave him and go away. So for five and a half hours, I was crawling behind him, watching him go through this pain and agony for a stupid lie that I uttered. 
And I decided there and then that I was never going to lie again. And I often think about that incident and wonder if he had punished me the way we would punish our children if we caught them lying, would I have learnt the lesson that he was trying to teach me or would I have just gone on, suffered the punishment and gone on lying over and over again and making sure the next time I don't get caught? And I said, I think basically that's what happens. People get caught in that trap and they just go on lying and lying and they get deeper into the trap there and, you know, it's very difficult to get out of it because of the culture of violence that we practice in our lives. So it's important that we change all of these things, these little things, our little relationships with each other, our relationships with our children and our relationships at home and and so on so that we can create that eventually that culture of non-violence that will bring peace and harmony to the world where we would be able to control violence to the bare minimum and not let it overpower us as it is happening today. I want to conclude now with one last story a story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us. It's the story of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and they tried their best to explain the meaning and nobody could really satisfy the king. And One day there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit and the king asked him to explain the meaning of peace and he said the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. And so the next day the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace and he wasn't about to show his ignorance to the sage. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to the palace and he found a little gold box and he placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. And then a few days later when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king cornered him and asked him to explain, said, you sent me to the sage and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what a grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that's when the intellectual said it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat locked up in the gold box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you allow that grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, it will sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if any one person has found peace, and if they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own personal gains, it will perish with them. But if they allow it to interact with all the elements, then it will sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peace. So I got that grain of wheat from my grandparents and I have come here today to give you that grain of wheat and I hope that you won't let it perish but let it interact with all the elements so that all of us together can transform this world and make it a place of peace and harmony. Thank you. Before we started, uh, Gandhi said, you may talk for two hours? And I <laughs> said, he said, usually they have a lot of questions, and the questions bring more and more answers. 
So I said, you just let me know when you want to stop, and then we'll go with the questions. And I know you probably all have questions for him. Who wants to go first? Now, come on. <laughs> you must way no. back there. Can you come over this way? Because I know there's a lot of questions about Gandhi's life that you would like to know about, and here's the man that has all of the answers. Okay. This is sort of a new age conference, or it's a transformation conference. What went through my mind when you said that the United States is produce, consuming 45% of the world's resources, um, I just wonder why somebody has to give up something for somebody else to have. Because my, my, my viewpoint has always been, or a futurist viewpoint could be that if we could get to more efficient technologies, there could be more for everybody instead of less. Are you under, what I'm trying to say is, it's almost like a lot of the ideas we work with are that our minds create our realities. So, I, so when you said that, I almost felt like it's okay it's almost like we're being blamed for our prosperity. And a lot of people believe that today that the United States is living off the rest of the world the way we consume resources. But as a, as a mental point of view, I've always thought, well, why does somebody... Anyway, I'm not making any sense, but <laughs> my question is... Anyway, I don't know what I'm saying, so I'll just shut up. <laughs> well, I, I think I understand what you're coming to. But you, we have to remember that the resources of the world are limited. And if one nation, because it's a prosperous nation, can take more of those resources and deprive the rest of the nations of those resources, then that's, un, uh, you know, it, it's wrong. It's like, for instance, we are living in a neighborhood. Uh, it's a middle-class neighborhood but a multimillionaire comes right in the middle of that neighborhood and starts buying up things and groceries and everything and, and destroying it, it's going to raise the price in the, uh, of everything in that neighborhood. And everybody else who has limited uh, resources, they're going to get mad at this person because he is buying up things, uh, you know, because he has the uh, money to do that. So that creates the inflation and then it creates the poverty because slowly we go down and down and, and it creates the imbalance which uh, we see if you expand that picture to the world. That's basically what's happening today. Now, you know, today, because of the gas prices going up so much, uh, every time President Bush talks about it, he blames it on India and, pa and China. He says, because India and China are consuming so much more gas uh, that we have to pay a higher price for it. What he isn't telling anybody is that India and China, between them, are only consuming one billion uh, barrels of gas, whereas the United States alone is con consuming more than 26 billion ga uh, uh, barrels of gas. So where is 26 billion and where is 1 billion and why should that 1 billion cause the um, gas prices to go up? So, you know, some sacri... I'm not saying that we become, you know, we become a poor nation and give up everything there, but there has to be a moderation in everything. Thank you. I, I, the one thing also, though, that like in Hindu philosophy, if you could explain about the untouchables, because a lot of times a, a perspective that I've read about is that people believe that wealth is karma, and that the the poor I, the poor are meant to be poor, the rich are meant to be rich, all that stuff. It, and no, it, that's an escapism. But, and uh, what about? Yeah. I, I don't know enough about your grandfather, but what was his stance on, on the untouchables? Well, actually, he was assassinated because he talked about eliminating the caste system altogether. He didn't want the caste system because it was evil, and he even stopped going to the temples because the temples, um, you know, practiced casteism and, and so on. 
but he was uh, totally against the caste system and he wanted that eliminated and the whole concept of karma and and that that's what you get for it is all totally wrong it's an escapism just to justify what people were doing there there's absolutely no reason why anybody should uh, be treated less than human and and other people treated more than human there and that's absolutely wrong there. and he was assassinated because he of this who else okay okay i was just thinking when we were talking about the the other man's question that we are giving away billions of dollars in Iraq and I don't think we're getting our money's worth, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I think we're creating the wrong thing. And probably we're using more gas in Iraq to do whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. I don't know. I, I have been against that mess there from the beginning but <clears throat> I don't understand that how we just aren't getting what we need to do we're creating violence there mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. I in fact after the attack on us on 9-11 I started getting a lot of calls from people who said how would you respond to this non-violently and so um, I, instead of answering every individual, I decided to write an article and offered it for publication. But nobody wanted to publish it because they said, this is not the time to speak of peace. And I said, if this is not the time to speak of peace, when do you speak of peace? <clears throat> but anyway, I put the article on my website and it was subsequently picked up from there by many organizations and uh, distributed. Even the Fulbright Association uh, copied the article and they distributed it, I believe, to all the uh, congressmen and senators in Washington, D.C. But the gist of the article was that this is not the time for us to seek revenge. It's the time for us to do some introspection to find out why are these people around the world, why do they hate us so much to want to do such damage to us? And what are our relationships with these people and how can we improve the relationships so that we don't have such attacks again in, in the future? And I said, <clears throat> I said the United States has now reached a point when it has demonstrated to the rest of the world that we are a superpower in terms of our military strength. We now need to demonstrate to the world that we can also be a superpower in terms of our moral strength. And, and you know, the foreign policy of the United States doesn't have to be what is good for the United States, but what is good for the rest of the world. Uh, uh, could you ex explain how Gandhi brought about their, their in independence of India? How he brought about the independence of India was uh, through nonviolent campaigns, nonviolent struggle against the British and uh, uh, and eventually the British realized that they couldn't continue to control India and had to give it up there. So it was through nonviolent campaign, you know, various forms of campaign, not submitting to um, injustices, not submitting to um, the British authority, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, disobedience of British authority and so on. But it was continuously a non-violent campaign. And one thing that showed is that one man could make a difference. Yes, certainly. But didn't you say also that uh, if he would have lived, he was trying to work out the, the between Pakistan and India, 
that they wouldn't have the problems today if they would have adopted his policies. Well, that was another thing, you know, when the British decided that they were uh, not be going to be able to control India any longer and that they had to give uh, India its freedom, mm -hmm. they, <clears throat> and, and Churchill made this statement in Parliament, he said, if India is going to uh, break up the British Empire, I am going to see to it that they regret it for the rest of their life. And one of the things that he did, and he instigated the Muslims to demand a separate nation. And so, uh, you know, they created that kind of an atmosphere and, on, and came to um, India saying that the only way we can give you independence is by cutting you up into India and Pakistan. And my grandfather said, no, I'm not going to accept that uh, on that basis. I'm willing to wait for another 10 years for independence, but not on the basis of partition. But the rest of the politicians were impatient. They wanted to get into power and, and do the things that they had dreamed of for such a long time. And so they ignored grandfather's uh, advice and went behind his back and accepted uh, the partition plan and the country was divided into India and Pakistan and that meant that millions of people were uprooted from places where they had been living for generations and had to go to a new place and start all over again there and that caused a lot of anger and violence and they started killing each other and and it ended up in a tremendous civil war uh, between the two people. And that still continues, that hate and that anger that gave, you know, began at the birth of uh, India and Pakistan is still going on. It was and about the time that Gandhi was assassinated too, wasn't it? So yeah. he couldn't follow through. Well, they, they had both these reasons, the reason of, uh, you know, when Pakistan was divided and when um, they, they had to divide the cash assets of the country too, mm -hmm. uh, the Indian government decided to withhold the cash assets that were meant for Pakistan because they wanted to compensate the Indian people who had lost their property in Pakistan. And grandfather said, this is wrong. And he says, I'm not going to let my nation begin its new life on a wrong footing. He said, you accepted, Pakistan, uh, you accepted the partition of the country and the consequence of it, you've got to suffer the consequences now. And if the Hindus had lost property in Pakistan, then equally the Muslims have lost property in India. So you cannot withhold this money to compensate one group of people and deny the other group of people. And if you are going to do that, he said, I'm going to fast unto death because I don't want to live in, in this kind of uh, country. And so they were forced to give that money. So that was the second reason why they decided to assassinate him. Mm. But it sounds very similar to what's happening in Israel right now. Mm -hmm. You're moving people to yeah. other places where they don't <clears throat> really live. Mm. History repeating itself. <laughs> okay. okay. I've noticed over the last oh, 20 years as a teacher also in raising my own children that anger has become a popular emotion um, in everything. And you teach anger man management skills. Um, it's, it seems like, well, just for instance, when I'd pick my children up from school, their friends would make fun of me because they'd say, why is your mom always so happy <laughs> type thing? And it was more, it was more popular to get in the car and complain about the day and who was wrong and I mean just on a family level type thing. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you about some of your basic um, techniques in anger management. I think what I've been doing with young people is to teach them the importance of anger. What is anger? they have to realize what is that emotion. 
uh, and because we haven't taught them about it, they don't know what that emotion is, and so they feel that when they get angry, they just have to lash out and, and become violent. So we have to explain to them what that emotion is and uh, why it, you know, causes this kind of uh, reaction in us. And then we ask them, what, what would you do, you know, in a certain situation which has caused you anger? You become violent and this would be the result of that. And if you practice non-violence, if you use that energy of anger in a positive manner, what would the result be? And try to make them work out the, the two results and which would be the better thing to do. And they no normally come to the conclusion that you know, a satisfactory resolution of the, the problem is much better than um, an aggressive solution. So, you know, it's, it's a long process. It's not something that you can do a one-day workshop for two hours or something and make them realize this. It's something that has to be an ongoing thing and, and help them deal with it. Um, on a daily basis. We had this program once in a school in Memphis. And um, the little kids there, they learned this uh, technique and they started using it among themselves. And then after a while, they came back to me and they said, Mr. Gandhi, we have a question for you. And I said, what is the question? And they said, well, we find double standards here. So you have taught us that we should practice nonviolence and uh, you know this kind of anger management between us. But when our parents deal with us, or if they are angry with us, or our teachers are angry with us, they thrash us. So why do the adults have to behave one way and we children behave another way? And you know that's right. So if we want the children to practice something, we have to teach them through our behavior. And it's make them understand that way. They would learn more that way than they would learn by just telling them things. Okay. Um, the subject of 9-11 has come up several times during this discussion. And the nonviolent response to this event, which has impressed me the most, is all the uh, people that have done very careful research into the facts of 9-11 found that the official story that we've been told makes no sense whatsoever from, uh, from all, you know, from all the uh, physical evidence, from a physics point of view, from all kinds of points of view. For instance, the, uh, there's a uh, <coughs> man who worked for the underwriter's laboratory that certified the steel used in the building. He says the fires from the airplane crashes could not possibly have been hot enough to melt the steel used in that building, especially since the steel was protected by uh, asbestos fireproofing coating. And so the, the idea that the buildings could have come down, come down because of the airplane crash is complete non nonsense, that they had to have been brought down by uh, controlled demolition explosives inside the buildings. And also, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> Building 7 collapsed at 5.30 in the afternoon. It was not hit by an airplane. There were some small fires in it, uh, nothing really serious, nothing that would have caused a skyscraper like that to collapse. But all of a sudden, at 5.30 in the afternoon, it collapsed without having been hit by an airplane. And Larry Silverstein, the uh, lease owner on the World Trade Center complex, said on national television about a year later that in consultation with the fire department, they had made the decision to pull that building, which means controlled demolition, which means it had been previously, before that day, packed with explosives, specifically in order to bring it down very perfectly, uh, you know, straight down the way the buildings are brought down by controlled demolition. And um, I asked a friend of mine who had been in the Navy right after 9-11 what he thought of the whole event. And he said our government had to have wanted those planes to get through and hit those buildings because they completely suspended all the normal procedures which they use to intercept any airplane that's gone off course. You know, they can do that within 10 minutes, get fighters up to intercept any airplanes that have gone off course. So all the evidence, and, and there's uh, uh, a lot of other, uh, other, other evidence for this kind of thing. I know there's a uh, <coughs> physics professor at uh, Brigham Young University, Stephen Jones, who studied the whole thing. He says that you know, he, he also says that the fires from those airplanes could not possibly have caused those buildings to collapse in that way. There's a maintenance man named uh, William Rodriguez who's become 
the great hero of 9-11 because he's personally saved about 200 people uh, and helped them get out of the buildings before they collapsed. And he was the last man out of one of the towers alive before it did collapse. And he said he heard huge explosions going off in the basement of the building just before the airplane hit it. And he's completely convinced that our own government did it by controlled demolition. So that's been the nonviolent response to 9-11 that's impressed me the most, is all the people that have gathered here very carefully, gathered, gathered as many facts as possible, and can prove now up, down, and sideways from every possible angle that just the airplanes themselves crashing into the buildings couldn't have caused them to collapse like that. And our own government must have been involved in arranging it and then covering up the uh, story of what really happened, you know, by uh, appointing the uh, Keene Commission, you know, to come up with a cover-up story for the events rather than telling us the truth. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think of this? Uh, what, what do you think of the work that these people have done to expose the real truth about 9-11 rather than believe the fable that we've been told? Well, I don't know. This is a very serious matter and uh, nobody will know what the real truth is until uh, impartial inquiry is made. So I would, uh, I wouldn't like to comment on that. My question is getting back to the Middle East. Uh, Golda Meir said that there would be peace between Israel and Palestine when the Palestinians learn to love their children more than they hate us, where they give children guns and to parade in the streets and say you kill and kill, and they teach them that from very young. I was just wondering what your perception about that situation is and that perpetual conflict of hate and growing, teaching hate versus anything else. Um, I partially agree with this. Um, I, I think there's been tremendous amount of hate both in Israel and Palestine. I went to both these countries uh, in two years ago in uh, 2004. And in fact, it turned out that I was the last foreigner to meet Yasser Arafat and talk to him. But what I was uh, stunned by was the level of hate and anger that persisted in both sides and, and how they were determined to finish off the other, other group. There. And, and I talked to both of them and I said, you know, what, what is it going to achieve for you? If you all die there and eventually free this land, who's going to live here and who's, who is going to enjoy it? So, you know, what is the purpose of this? You ought to try to find a non-violent solution uh, to this whole problem there. And you're right that, you know, generation after generation are fed with a lot of anger and hate there for each other and it just perpetuates itself. And somebody somewhere has to break that cycle. I was just wondering if your grandfather had shared any experience that he might have had uh, in relationship to Mother Earth and the sensitivity that we humans should have. Oh yes, he he had that whole concept. He said that in the Hindu philosophy we treat Earth as Mother Earth because Mother uh, feeds you and the Earth feeds you and so it's the Mother and and we have to respect the Earth just as we would respect our Mother. So he tried to foster that kind of respect in the people and he also practiced it himself when he said that we should not commit violence against nature, uh, just as we should not commit violence against human beings there. So he, he did his best. In fact, I think he started the movement of ecology and environment much before uh, anybody anywhere in the world uh, had even thought about it. We, uh, you know, way back in the 1915 and, and 20 and 25, uh, he was talking to people about conserving and um, and saving environment and all that. And at that time, people just didn't really understand what he was talking about. Um, my question is a little off of what we're talking about. I know that, you know, India is your home and Gandhi was your grandfather, so I'm assuming that you've met Mother Teresa. Can you 
Yeah, before she passed away. Can, did you have a distinct impression about her? Or how did she feel? Depression of? The impression of Mother Teresa. Of Mother Teresa. <clears throat> well, my greatest regret is that I never get, get a chance to meet her. I lived in India for many years, but we worked in Bombay and she was in Calcutta and it's about a thousand miles apart. And, um, you know, in India travel is not very easy and we don't travel so much as people here do. And I kept procrastinating and, and thinking that I will be able to meet her sometime later and never got the chance to meet her. But she did a tremendous. She did tremendous work, and my grandfather also understood and appreciated her work tremendously. In um, the world, <clears throat> all countries uh, have uh, highly competitive cultures, and it's evidenced by their the sports, for example. Some, some are not as violent. Uh, but some things like soccer and boxing and fight clubs and those types of things. And I, I believe that, that that is infused in our society all the way up. As you can see, in our politics now have become so highly competitive and polarized. Um, what is your feeling on the value and the, the emphasis we place on sports and competition in, in the world? I don't think we play sports at all. This is not sports, it's a, a form of violence. <clears throat> I think it would be wrong for us to call it sports. It's um, gladiators fighting each other for money. Um, my question is a personal nature. My mother passed away less than two weeks ago. She was Hindu, mm -hmm. and she was a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, one of her wishes was that I take some of her ashes to the Ganges, Divine Mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know if that is possible or who I would need to contact in that regard? Because she loved your grandfather very dearly as well, and she knew that was one of the ways he was resolved. So that's one of the reasons she wanted to be there. Uh, yes, I'm very sorry to hear about her death. It, um, it is possible to take the ashes. Um, you would have to go to North India, to Allahabad, where the confluence of three rivers takes place, and that's where most of the Hindus would immerse their ashes. And uh, it's just a question of going to Do India. Do I need to get per it. permit or something? Just no, go. nothing. You can go. And the name there. of the town was? Allahabad in North India. Thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, to go to India, you need a visa. Well, if there's no more questions, there's one thing I wanted you to elaborate on. Oh, one over here? Okay. I got one more before. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, just one small comment on the very, I think it was the first question. One of the things that we've learned is that we all do better when we all do better. And we're not really giving things up when we all do better. We're, we're receiving. So I, just a comment. All right, Mr. Gandhi's uh, this association, uh, what do you want to call it? The M.K. Gandhi Institute the, for Nonviolence. Is located in Memphis, and it's in the um, Christian Brothers University. They have given him office space, and this is where the, it, the offices <coughs> are. He's moved to New York because his wife has been ill, but the headquarters are in Memphis would like you to tell them why you chose Memphis, because people kept saying they thought that was very strange. 
<laughs> for you to pick Memphis. <coughs> well, yes, whenever people ask me about it, I said, why not Memphis? You know? um, why the Deep South? <clears throat> Well, there were two reasons, but the important thing was that the Christian Brothers University gave us hospitality, and we didn't have a lot of money uh, to choose where we wanted to stay, and so we accepted that hospitality. But also the second reason was that Dr. King was assassinated there, and I thought it was very appropriate that we should work in nonviolence in Memphis and the whole southern region in fact. So although it's located in Memphis, it's now become a, an international organization, so it kind of spreads its message around to many parts of the country and the world. All right. She wants to know what your website is. The website is gandhiinstitute.org, G-A-N-D-H-I Institute. Dot org. Okay. And Mr. Gandhi travels with this institute all over the world, lecturing everywhere. Is it okay for me to say, too, that you said not, nothing you make, you can never make a profit on? This was one of Gandhi's instructions. None of his family could ever make a profit on his name. Yeah. So everything you make has to go back to the institute. Mm -hmm. And. You have to do what your grandfather said. <laughs> okay. Other people yeah, he, can... Uh, you know, during his lifetime, he realized that if he didn't uh, handle the copyright of all his writings, uh -huh. uh, the family might misuse it after his death. So he created a public trust and um, vested the copyrights of all his works mm -hmm. in that public trust. Uh -huh. And he made a point that no member of the family would ever be appointed on that trust. So even when I want to use some of his writings in my books, I have to get permission from that trust. Mm -hmm. And if they demand a part of the royalty, I have to give it to them. So mm -hmm. there's nothing with the family. Everything has been uh, given away to the public. Mm -hmm. But other people can make a profit on the Gandhi name, but, but yeah, you others can. others do that. <laughs> but okay. the family is not allowed to. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right, then I want to. Oh, over here, one more. Okay. I think she has a question. There. Okay. Uh, I'll make this short and sweet. Uh, I was told by a medium that uh, on anger, to get rid of anger, is to write it down on a piece of paper and say the all the worst things you can think of. Then you take that piece of paper, go to the kitchen, and burn it in the, in the sink. And that will help you to release it. And also, too, that it, uh, the burning also has some uh, connotation to it. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. Uh, you know, there's a distinction between getting it out of your system and and working on it positively. You know, one, this is one of the ways of getting it out of your system. I've heard of people uh, who go out into nature and yell at tree trees. I've seen this in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, where they went up to the redwood trees and they would stand there and yell at the trees and take their anger out there. But the thing is that, you know, getting the anger out of your system is one thing, but if you don't uh, focus on the issue that caused the anger and, and resolve that issue, then it's going to come back over and over again and eventually you're going to get tired of getting it out of your system and you're going to deal with that anger. So. It's very important that while we get it out of the system that we also focus on resolving the issue that caused the anger in the first place. Does somebody over there had a question? Okay. Okay, move it over here. We're recording all of this. Yeah, sorry. Um, are you the only grandson of the... No, Gandhi had four sons, and between the four sons, we have 14 grandchildren. Oh, I see, because you seem to have gotten 
quite a bit of uh, attention and yeah, well I am the only one who has devoted my life to this kind of work. <laughs> See. Mm. Also, I was quite curious. Um, All the other ones want to leave a normal life. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, Nehru, he, uh, he was, was he one of the uh, politicians who was uh, eager to get started before yeah. the uh, yeah. uh, separation? Or? Mm -hmm. And um, what was the uh, actual relationship between um, Gandhi and Lady Mountbatten? Gandhi and Lady Mountbatten? Yes, um, you remember that when um, British uh, handed over India, um, there was there was a small episode, I guess, between um, Lady Mountbatten and Gandhi uh, when he uh, apparently put his hand on her shoulder, and uh, uh, at first she was uh, upset, and then she was very pleased. And I've also heard that uh, Gandhi especially cared for her, uh, thought she was quite a special person. No, I don't think there was any special, everybody was special for Gandhi. Was and whenever for Gandhi. <laughs> anybody well, came, he, there, he always put his hands across, across their shoulders. She, she, he did that always. Yeah. But there was a, <laughs> an affair between Nehru and Lady Mountbatten. Oh, could I have the wrong person? <laughs> So you're mixing up. <laughs> well, that's that's certainly interesting. Yeah. Pardon my mistake there. Okay. You had a question here. Okay. As we're watching the clock, because they don't want the tape to stop off. It seemed like listening to you tonight is that nonviolence is like a whisper in a windstorm of violence. Do you get discouraged the fact that the world really hasn't picked up on the on the nonviolent uh, approach to, to life. It seems like, you know, I've quit watching TV the last six years because I used to watch news all the time and just get upset. Now I just look at the paper at the sections that I want to look at because I don't want to look at the non you know, on the, all the violence that's going on. Do you ever get discouraged that it doesn't seem to be catching on like it should? I don't get discouraged. I do get uh, disheartened uh, and I feel that, you know, the world needs to know and understand. And one of the things that I have learned from grandfather, he had always told us that uh, peacemakers are like farmers. They can only go out and plant seeds and then hope and pray that those seeds will germinate and eventually you get a good crop. So I go around and I plant the seeds in the minds of people and then I wait for the seeds to germinate. So I am here to plant seeds in your minds. I'm responding to the last question. We have a lot of cause to be actually encouraged by the um, increase of nonviolence in the world. There is actually an organization called the Nonviolent Peace Force, which was created in the last few, words, last few years. And it was based on the work which was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi and was taken up by, um, I think, Mr. Gandhi, you can supply the name, a gentleman in Pakistan who started the Shanti Sena. In Sri Lanka. The gentleman in Sri Lanka. Well, the Nonviolent Peace Force is focusing its efforts on Sri Lanka, but um, there was a Muslim um, leader uh, of an Khan army. Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Pardon? Abdul Ghaffar Khan. That's right, yes. And he, in, in, during the lifetime of Mahatma Gandhi, was so impressed by Mahatma Gandhi's work that he turned over his whole army to peaceful work. And the word Shanti in India means peace, and Sena means army. So he created the first peace army, Shanti Sena, in the world. And then other events happened, and um, this was not continued for some time. But there are a group of people in this country, in the United States, who are tremendously courageous. I mean, they've done things like lie across railway lines to prevent trains, and one of them lost his legs because the train didn't stop. Um, and they worked with, um, with um, Martin Luther King and so on. 
but now they've created the Nonviolent Peace Force, which at the moment is focusing, uh, the Nonviolent Peace Force is focused in Sri Lanka at the moment. And they have, I believe, several hundred trained peace workers. And they've approached the United Nations. And the United Nations has said that if, over the course of six years, they can really prove results, then they would qualify for financial support from the United Nations. So I believe, actually, Mr. Gandhi has a great deal to um, encourage him in his work. And the seeds that he and others are um, sowing are actually bearing fruit. It's just that we have to somehow work on the media to um, report these and make them better known. There's a, new, um, an, a magazine called, I think it's The New Internationalist, which published several articles on the work of the Nonviolent Peace Force. And there is, um, there is a website, I think it's nonviolentpeaceforce.org or something like that. Um, anyway, if you play around with NP, Nonviolent Peace Force, and Nonviolent Peace Force, you should eventually find it. But there's actually a great deal of cause for hope in the world today.